Hey everybody, welcome to the Learning Center. My name is Justin Carlson. I'm standing uncomfortably close to Marilyn right now because she's wearing the microphone that's uh, sending the audio out to our streaming uh, folks. So I'm trying to just be real close here for a minute. We're all friends on this bus. We're getting <laughs> and becoming so much more so more quickly. Um, so welcome for being here. My name is Justin Carlson. I lead the uh, technology and the EdTD team. So really glad to have you all here tonight. Who's uh, first time? Who's 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 here for the first time at Hill tonight? Okay, great. Glad to have you here. Um, who's who's first uh, time at a CES, a community um, Ed Series event? Who's it tonight? Okay, great. We're glad to have some some new folks, new faces here. Just for you who don't know, we offer um, a number of these a year. It's really our opportunity to engage and educate the community, provide resources, really talk about the, uh, the mission of Hill, the work of Hill, and the areas we're passionate about, really bring that into the community. So we're really glad to have you here. We couldn't do it without our sponsors, uh, the Morris family, John and Wayne Nell Morris. They are sponsoring this for their honor, their son, Scott, who's an alum of the Hill Center. Uh, Hill offers just a quick little snapshot about the Hill Center. We offer a school year program, a summer programs, and a tutoring program for students with learning differences in ADHD. We work here in Durham, but also around the Triangle. So uh, if you're interested in learning more about that, feel free to talk to me or any Hill per, per, uh, person who's here. We also offer teacher training, professional development opportunities for public school teachers and private school teachers. And we offer those here and around, um, around the state. One of our really passionate areas of work is around our Hill methodology and our reading program. We work with over 30 districts in North Carolina, exporting our reading program and our training working with students. So we're really excited about that work. Uh, just a quick little shameless plug here. We do have a, a PD <laughs> calendar for this year. That's out in the hall. So if you're interested in some other professional development opportunities, please grab that. Uh, we actually have Marilyn here tomorrow for a multi-sensory math workshop. It's not too late to be a part of that. And also we've got um, a community ed calendar, which we've got listed out there. I'd like to tell you a little bit more about these events that are coming up. And we've just added a few things in the past couple of days. So uh, we have Marilyn tonight, woohoo. Um, how to On February 20th, we have How to Accept Our Child for Who They Are with Debbie Reber. Um, on February 24th, we're going to be at the Museum of Life and Science Community Day. We'll have a table there, so please stop by and see and learn about Hill some. On February 26th, we have Gender Differences and ADHD and How They Affect Learning with Dr. Patricia Quinn. Uh, really excited on March 5th, we're going to uh, um, have a screening of the documentary Angst, which really raises awareness around anxiety. A variety of experts and, and students will be speaking in that, so that's really um, really good session. It'll be a Q&A at the end. And then on April 9th, we have ADHD Diagnosis and Treatment um, in Children and Adolescents with Dr. Uh, Naomi Davis and Julie um, Schechter, uh, both of Duke ADHD Clinic. So that's going to be a good session as well. So please attend those. I don't think this microphone's doing anything. Okay. There you go. Okay. Well, now, I'm going to start <laughs> over. Okay. I knew not, we could not. Here okay, I'm not going to start over, I promise. Okay, I'm going to read this, but it's really much more heartfelt than, than Oh, okay. That. And I'll talk about your Nobel Prize, your space yes. travel. Yes, and, and swimming the English Channel. Swimming the English right. Channel, okay. <laughs> All of this is true. She's a very accomplished woman. Okay, we're really glad to have Marilyn Zecker. Oh, my gosh. I'm in my 40s, so let me put these on. Child. Yeah, I'm a child. <laughs> I just wanted to rub that in. <laughs> this is all my natural hair, too. Okay, Marilyn Zecker is a teacher, nationally certified academic language therapist specializing in the application of OG multisensory strategies for teaching math, study skills, reading, and language, Spanish, and content area subjects. Ms. Zecker is a former classroom and demonstration teacher and an Orton Gillingham based public school program. She holds a BA in education and a BA and MA in English. In 2004, Ms. Zecker received her certification as an academic therapist specializing in multisensory mathematics and study skills. Ms. Zecker is a presenter at IDA and LDA and the National Teachers of Mathematics National and Regional Conferences. And you swam Link's channel and you've been an astronaut. And a brain science, a, a brain, brain surgeon. Brain surgeon. Right, and okay. Very accomplished. We're really glad to <laughs> have you. Very accomplished. Here. Thank you. And it's so nice to be here. I really feel fortunate to be associated with the Hill Center. Those of us in the field of learning differences know all those places around the country where people do good work, and this is one of them. So I was really pleased to be invited to speak here. 
I was a demonstration teacher, and after my husband and I traveled for about seven years, living in the back of a little Isuzu truck, we uh, came back and I decided to do some, some academic support. And I realized that my high school and middle school students were learning to read very well, but they were not doing well in algebra. So I began studying with Dr. Joyce Steves, who is uh, a fellow of the Orton-Dillingham Academy. She and her protege, Harley Toomey, were developing the OG approach to math. Now, how many of you are familiar with the term OG? Some of you, that's good. If you aren't, you don't have to be to understand this. So what I did was I started looking at Orton-Gillingham or multisensory applications in math. I immersed myself in the neuroscience of how the brain does learn math. And I put all these things together. I began to present for the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics, the IDA and the LDA. So I have about 40 years experience working with students who learn differently from kindergarten through college. I currently spend most of my time now in the area of math because this is a very unique approach. It's not a program. It's not a curriculum. It can be used with any curriculum in any school setting. When the educator knows the basic math concepts and has you use your hands in your learning, and we put together a multi-sensory loop where you hear it, see it, say it, touch it, feel it, recognize it, you're creating, as Dr. Judy Willis says, different memories in different parts of the brain that create uh, the ability for retrieval. So tonight we're going to look at why some children do struggle in mathematics and what we now know we can do about it. So as we begin, I'm just going to give a little anecdote here. In the United Kingdom, they did a survey of people to see how they felt about maybe not doing so well in one subject or another. And they asked them, and 68% of the people, the majority of people said they would be embarrassed to tell people they did poorly in English in their native tongue. And yet at the same time, only 38% said they would be embarrassed to say they did poorly in math. 60% of people are okay with saying I'm not a math person. And by the way, please do not say that to your children. But why is this that we feel comfortable saying we're not good in math? What is it that we're missing? Well, years ago, some scientists began looking at the brain through fMRI studies, and they honed in on what they considered to be the core deficit in reading. They learned that this ability to distinguish individual sounds and the sound symbol correspondence, we call it phonemic awareness, is a core deficit in reading. The same scientists who established that began looking at math a little bit later. And I believe it has fundamentally changed how we approach teaching math. And it's going to tell us a lot about what we can do to intervene early and late if children are not doing well. So this is audience participation time. Pencils down, please. You may use your outside voices and we're going to play a game called Name That Quantity. Here we go. Name that quantity. Oh, come on, you can do better than that. One. Name that quantity. Name that quantity. Who can give me a math sentence about that quantity? Come on. What's a, give me a math sentence. That's a question, and that's a great question. I can even just make it a statement. 3 plus 1 equals, and that's an equation. Name that quantity and this quantity. Did you notice that took you a second? There was this palpable breath. Who used a strategy to figure out that quantity? What did you do? Anyone at this table, shout it out. What did you see? Three, three, and one. Did anybody see five and two? I did. I'm just, I'm weird. What can I say? That was proving some of the research. Let's look again. Name that quantity. Look at the place value, Matt, people. We have a 
hundred, how many tens, and now tell me how many ones. Let's read that number together. We have 100, excellent job. How did you know that was five? It's a pattern, it's tally marks. Name that quantity. And can I tell you what I hear in every workshop? Even with teachers, I hear this. I hear 1,430, right? <laughs> you just proved the research. The scientists don't need to do fMRI studies of your brain. You passed the test. Let's name that quantity. Come on now, it's taking you a minute. <laughs> Can you tell how you had to figure that out, though? You had to count, didn't you? I'm going to give you your first takeaway from tonight. Counting is inefficient. It's natural. This is why we have fingers and toes. But you don't have a third foot or a third arm. It has its limits. Let's go to the next one. Name that quantity. Now, that didn't take you very long. Why? It's a pattern. Name this quantity. Eight. And that's not a recognizable pattern, but you saw that immediately. So I, for those of you who want to write this down, I'm going to say a name, Douglas Clement. The article is called Subitizing. 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 What it is, why teach it? It's available online. Go to Google after the workshop, look it up. You just did the second level. Let's go on. Name that quantity. Did you have to do anything or did you just know it? Let's do another one. Name that quantity. That's the second level of subitizing. Let's name that quantity. Eight what? Eight fourths. And what's the simplified form of that fraction? I just taught you to simplify a fraction with a picture. Is that cool or what? Let's try again. Name that quantity. Fifteen. And how did you figure that? Did you see a pattern? Did you know that those cubes were stacked four with one on top because it's similar to a dice pattern? I call it a pyramid of five. Let's try another one. Name that quantity, all the cubes and all. Any middle school teachers in here? Okay, give it a shot. <laughs> we have a four by four rectangle. How many will be in that green one? Sixteen. Hold that number in working memory. Sixteen, sixteen, sixteen. I have a three by five, three by three blue box, a uh, box. Nine, 16 plus nine. Okay, and then I have a two by two block. So 25 and four make, and you just did some good mental math. Well, let's see about this one. This is three by three by three. How many cubes in all? 27, three to the third power, you algebra teachers out there, is 27. We can learn these patterns and these number relationships, but it takes practice and it takes explicit instruction. How many dogs? And how many of you will count one by one? And how many of you will group them into patterns? Some people will say four, four, four. That would be how many in all? Okay. That is subitizing. The human brain wants to subitize. And this is the toughest one up here because this is not your traditional representation of decimal fractions. You notice that we have five in the ones place. This is five and 235 thousandths. And when the children make these with clay, they say, but it's so small. And you say, what do you think a thousandth of something is? It's a tiny little bit. And when their hands are busy, their attention is focused. That's something to remember. So here's what the research says, and you proved the research. As we did the fMRI studies, or the scientists did, they found out that the brain becomes active in certain areas when it is performing math computations and, and calculations. Put your right hand on the right side of your brain. 
This is the non-language hemisphere. It is very active when we add, when we subtract, and when we just sort of see quantities and recognize them. Switch. This is the left hemisphere of the brain. It is the language dominant hemisphere of the brain. It becomes active, more active. We use the whole brain all the time. You know, forget that left brain, right brain stuff. We use the whole brain. But it is more active once we start retrieving the words for math like multiplication. Do I have any parents in here whose children who have trouble learning the times tables? And that's one of the reasons you're here, and I'm telling you why they have trouble learning the times tables. It's not math. It's word retrieval. I was talking with Dr. Sally Chavis about this not long ago. We have ample evidence now to, to prove that for many of our students who have language-based learning disabilities or dyslexia, that learning the times tables is more of a word retrieval activity. Do you remember learning the states and their capitals and how difficult that was? Well, that's like learning the times tables. And it's one of the reasons that children can seem to be doing very well and get up through third grade <coughs> or to third grade, and then they get into a curriculum that teaches as as my husband's granddaughter told me yesterday, oh, when I taught in third grade, I had to teach all the times tables in two weeks. And they didn't learn them. And that's one of the reasons. They don't get adequate practice to mastery with, and now this is another phrase you want to take home from here. We teach fewer facts at a time to develop fluency over time. And we give them adequate practice at that. So it's fewer facts at a time to develop fluency over time. And they use them in everything you do while they're working with that targeted set of number facts. And it just makes sense. If we want to memorize anything, and I've helped students memorize you know, parts of the Constitution and the, the Declaration of Independence, we didn't just sit down and look at it and know it. It took practice and repetition to get to mastery. Multiplication takes time. And for severe students who have sev a severe case of or an impact of language-based disabilities, it can take three to four years to develop a fairly good fluency with multiplication facts. So we need to know that and not give them these time tests that make them have huge anxiety and stress. So the search for the core deficit. Neuropsychology has proved the existence of what we call the number module in the right hemisphere of the brain. It's where we see quantities. It is the same sources of research that prove phonological awareness and phonemic awareness or core deficits in reading. Number sense, as Stanislas Dehaene call, calls it, Dehaene I think is the way he pronounces that. I keep getting that wrong, Dehaene. Uh, it's critical to improving math. And so when you get that fifth, sixth, seventh, or eighth grader who doesn't yet know that eight plus three, uh, five plus three is eight, he's going to fail at three minus eight is negative five. Everything that we build in those early number facts, all the addition facts up to 10 on every number under 10, they have to see the patterns, they have to be able to close their eyes and say, as you did with that domino, five and four, nine. So let's do some mental math. It's called go to the 10. We're going to decompose 7 as 2 plus 5. 2 plus 5. We're going to add 7 to 8. 8 plus 2 makes 10. Add the rest of it. We get 15. What is 28 plus 7? Add the 2 to get to 30. Add 5 more. We get to 35. Let's do another one. What is 58 plus 7? Add the two to get to, and five more makes. That's great. Let's do 92 minus seven. Take away the two to get to 90. Take away five. We need to teach our students to compose and decompose quantities and see them so we don't give them a calculator too early. And you know, one of my pet peeves is that we would never take a third grade child who is failing to learn to read and say, that's it, didn't work, give them talking books. We would never stop teaching that child to read. And yet, what do we do in math? 
when they don't learn their math facts as quickly as we would like them to? We hand them a calculator, and it's garbage in, garbage out. They often learn to do procedures in math without understanding them. I believe in accommodations, and I believe in calculators. Nobody does triple-digit long division anymore without a calculator. And yet our students do need to know these number facts, and they can be taught them with pattern recognition the same as we might teach them in reading. And so with your younger students, and even your intervention students who are older, go back and teach those add-ins of six, seven, eight, and nine, and then use them. But targeted number facts for a period of time so they develop automaticity, then go to a new number. The activity I just did with you for the decomposition of seven and the go to the 10 strategy, I do in my summer program for dyslexic students in pre-algebra. And we do those as our warm-up in our practice page. And we use those facts before we need them for integers and before we need them to say 5x plus 2x is 7x and 5 eighths plus 2 eighths is 7 eighths. We can use that basic addition of the decomposition of 7 across quant concepts. Everything from adding and subtracting with decomposing and composing tens and hundreds and thousands to fractions and pre-algebra and algebra. But you've got to get those number facts into them in a multi-sensory way where they build it, they draw it, they see it, and they remember it. One of my favorite manipulatives for young students is here, and I'm going to switch back and forth occasionally to show you a few things. I often take a Microsoft Word insert table, I draw a domino. I'm going to do, do it by drawing tonight. And so I create my domino. and we start to make patterns. Children love things like these flat glass marbles from the craft store, and they like to put them in patterns. This morning, I was playing napkin ring math with a four-year-old, and he was decomposing seven with me using napkin holders on the table. You can take a pattern like this and have the child build it in that domino pattern and then say, if that's five, indulge me for a moment, let's do some Taekwondo. One, two, three, four, five. And the child punches the middle of the five. Because the research tells us that we can recognize up to four without counting. And that is the part you proved. Anything over four has to be in a pattern. Tally marks the dice pattern of five, five and four make nine. Anything over four, the human brain needs a pattern to recognize it. So your student can say, if that's five, can you show me three plus two? Is it still five? That's what the four-year-old today learned. It's called conservation of quantity. It's the same amount of stuff, but it's in a different configuration. If that's 3 plus 2 equaling 5, could I make it into 4 plus 1 equals 5? And what is 5 minus 1? There's your takeaway. So you can do subtraction and addition at the same time. I also, for young students, like to take simple, easy things that are inexpensive. You don't need to go to some educational supply store and spend $300 on manipulatives. One of my favorite manipulatives for young children is this one. It's called a bead ring with five beads and a pipe cleaner. And with that, I can move it to illustrate the various add-ins of five. And the child can use this. I call it my first calculator. Simple things that teach numeracy and number sense quite early. So back to the presentation. So numeracy or number sense is our first 
for deficit in math, it must be in place. Because in order to take that and apply it to place value, I first need to know that 4 plus 5 is 9. And if 4 plus 5 is 9, 40 plus 50 is 90. And 400 plus 500 is 900. And 9,000 minus 4,000 is 5,000. The applications across place value are immor immensely important. Place value exists for one reason, subitizing larger quantities. I want to be able to recognize them without counting. But I first have to understand all the add-ins that are numbers below 10 and then 10. And once I build my 10, I can be ready to roll. So we've got to get those foundation skills in. So number sense can be shown in any number of ways. It's quantity awareness without counting. Those of you who have worked in the classroom may recognize this. That represents 1,000 little cubes. Has anyone in here ever seen Crocodile Dundee, the movie? There's a scene in Crocodile Dundee. If you don't know it, I'll sh tell it to you. He's on the streets of New York, and he's about to be robbed, and a guy pulls out a knife. And Crocodile Dundee says, you call that a knife? And he pulls out this big old knife. Now that's a knife. Well, when I go into fourth and fifth grade classrooms and I say, you call that a thousand? No. Now that is a thousand. It's ten craft sticks bundled into a ten, ten tens build into a hundred, ten hundreds bundled into a thousand, and each stick is there. They see that the quantity of a thousand is made up of a composition of individual ones. That's eight dollars worth of craft sticks if you buy them retail. And it's hair bands from Dollar Tree, elastic bands for lawyers briefs, and the children can bundle them themselves. If you take a second or third grade classroom have them put down two sets of tallies with craft sticks. Bundle them. Hand them to your neighbor. Your neighbor bundles them up. Make two more sets of tallies. Hand them next door. They get bundled. Two sets of tallies. See how many tens you can build in four minutes. They love to be timed for that kind of activity. And most of the teachers who work with me say their first and second graders learn place value in a matter of one to two days because they're bundling at 10. So numeracy and subitizing is our core deficit, and it should occur without counting. It exists at all levels of math, including fractions and decimals. How many of you know that a place value map can be with ones, tens, hundreds, and thousands? But did you know you can add fractions of one to your place value map? And it creates the idea that when we take our one, it's the one from which many are made or fractions are cut. So when you take your students with your craft sticks and say, that's 12, what would I have to do to subtract 8? Well, I'd have to unbundle the 10, right? It's called, in many programs, it's called regrouping. Now the, the word decomposing, you may hear that when children bring home homework, decompose the 10. I get them to do that, and then I say, now, take away one half. And the students look at me and they say, but, but I'd have to break the stick. And you say, a man's got to do what a man's got to do. <laughs> because that's what a half is. You break the one into two equal parts. So I'm going to move on. So our quantity representations, we can recognize up to four without counting. Other than that, it must be in a pattern. Now, I don't want you to count the rhombi there, because it's the same number as dots on that domino. Pattern recognition is where it's at for our foundation skill, but it's a crucial skill for number operations. The little boy who says, I'm this many, has no idea. He doesn't know what four is, let alone four years. Counting is normal for young children, but I do not want to see an 11th grader come in and counting 2x squared plus 7x squared on his fingers. And I see that because they don't have numeracy. So that this many, he has to really mimic, you know, 
what he's heard, but he doesn't have any concept of years. Young, <coughs> young children, excuse me, learn by counting objects, one by one by one. And we want to link that to the number line and to patterns of quantities. The What Works Clearinghouse, if you don't know it, it's a part of the Department of Education. And it has these practice guides that come from culling through all the research. And one of them is called Helping, Supporting Students Who Struggle in Math. And it says that students need explicit instruction with multiple representations. Not just bar models of fractions, but circles and shapes and, and all kinds of things. Breaking you know, the banana in half, for Pete's sake. We need multiple representations, and the number line is a very important one, but it's not the only one. And we want to stress pattern recognition equal to, if not more than, counting. We can count on to add, but those eighth graders who haven't mastered five plus three have been taught to count on to add and have not been taught the add ends for pictures and building and constructions. Here's one of the linkages we would say in the, the reading field we call the linkage between the sound symbol correspondence and how we write the letter. In math, we have three linkages. We have the quantity of three, the numeral three, and the name three. They must be linked as the child is learning quantity awareness. They have not been taught just automatic counting, counting up to 10 rote memory, like saying, dir, iti, uch, dirt, bet, ati, yeti, seti, sofi, don, and dir, on iti, on uch. I can count. You have no idea what I'm doing. That's just memorizing words. The numbers and quantities must be tied to the number of objects. And anything above four needs to be in a pattern. And that's why many of our children who have only been taught to count by rote and to count along the number line still have not mastered their math facts. So if you're an early ed teacher or a parent working with young children, you need to work with those multiple representations and pattern recognition. If you're a parent whose older child has not mastered this, maybe you have a child in special education or an older student in an intervention program, you can go back and do this without offending them. You can play games, for example. There are some bowls with dice on your table. Please get one bowl between two people. Okay. So if you're a reading teacher, you're familiar with the term visual review deck. A visual review deck is a set of cards that the teacher uses and this child responds when shown the letter A. They say A, apple, A. In math, your dominoes or your dice patterns can become your visual review deck. This is 4 plus 3 is 7. Watch my hand. 7 minus 3 is 7 minus 4 is. And we build that number sense with our visual review deck. Later, we can play games. One game is to take two dice and throw them in a bowl and name the total quantity. I'm going to do four. Would you call out the total quantity when you see it? Nine. Eight. Excellent job. Now we're going to play a game. If I'm a primary school teacher, I'm playing make a five. If you see a five, it's worth one point. If you see two dice that add up to five, you get a set of tally marks or five points. So when I roll the dice, I say, come on, baby, mama needs a five. Ah, there's a 5.5, right? Let's try again. My partner, this is me and thee. This is thy turn. And you don't have any fives. You miss your turn. I'm going to do it again. Here we go. Do I have a, I have a 1.5 and I have a 5.5. So that hand is worth six points. A set of tallies for this one, and one point for the single five. If you have an older student, let's make a five. I'm gonna, because this is an hour and a half, I don't want to keep you past bedtime. I'm going to show you the second level of the game. The second level is called make a 10. 
we read, for example, 6 plus 3 equals 9, and we say 9, just like you did on my name that quantity activity. 9 plus 1 is 10. That's worth 5 points. But if I have 6 and 4, or 5 and 5, it's a 1.10. So this is a 5.10. This is a 1.10. You may play the game with those at your table for one minute, and when I give you the signal, you will stop and get silent. Okay? Begin. For those of you at home, I am rolling my hand, and I see I have two 5.5s and a 1.5. That is like the master, master roll. This hand is worth 11 points. Now, if you're rolling at home, you can do this one. Oh, let's see. Do I oh, I have a 1.5, a 1.5, and that's it. That hand is worth two points. This one. Ooh, I have a 5.5 and a 5.5. That hand is worth two sets of tallies, or 10 points. So if you're playing along with us at home, you're looking at five dice, Yahtzee dice in a bowl, and you are able to play this in airport lounges, in the car on the way to Idaho. You can play this game anywhere. It's cheap and easy and fun to play. Children love it. I even play this with high school students. I just don't tell them it's a basic quantity awareness game. You've had your chance. And so we're going back to the PowerPoint. So if we look at what we have to do for our foundation skills, our students now can learn to add, subtract, getting ready to move toward that multipli multiplication and division hurdle. The core deficit in math, then, is quantity awareness. It's called numeracy, or subitizing, and we want to to get the child to recognize quantities without counting. In school, I like to do this. I find that students who can do crafts sticks before they move to the base 10 block have a greater understanding of place value. When I train, I train teachers by distance classes, you're getting an hour and a half of 60 hours of graduate level instruction, by the way. I have two distance classes online for this. The first one goes to fractions. The second one goes from fractions to algebra. And multisensory math, hands-on instruction should continue up through algebra 2. And I know that's going to sound funny, but you really can use manipulatives at all levels of math. So we do our quantity awareness and our place value building. And once we know about place value, we transition to the base 10 blocks because they are more efficient. If you are homeschooling, if you are a teacher in a classroom, you may hear teachers say, manipulatives are messy and they're time consuming and the children build with them. First of all, there are rules. These are learning tools. And if you don't use them efficiently and effectively, you lose the right to use them. And I've got five worksheets on my desk for anybody who cannot effectively use their learning tools. Number two, they are time consuming. The teachers who use them routinely report that they do less, pre uh, less review and reteaching when the students thoroughly understand the concepts. And the third rule of thumb is that you, you, lose, you use them frequently enough that they lose their novelty. Yes, when you bring something new out and put it in the children's hands, they're going to play because they're kids. But as you teach them to use these learning tools, they learn to use them effectively. And my rule for teachers is, do not torture your children with base 10 blocks. The manipulative you choose must be efficient and effective for what you're teaching. Because the goal of using manipulatives is to get rid of them. We want our children not to have to use them on their tests or to calculate. This is not an inefficient calculator. 
but it's there to instill in the child a real hands-on experience with a math concept. So I even extend this place value to decimal fractions by using clay for my unit cubes and cutting them in the shapes of the base 10 block whole numbers. And then the activity that moves to the traditional decimal representation is called reunitizing. Teachers can go on websites for you know, how to teach math and some instructor will say, and this works because we're doing reunitizing. But if we just do it and don't explain to the children why it works, it doesn't make sense to them. So you have to move from known to what is new and transition to your new representations. So that leads to the ability to work with pattern-based systems like time and money. When you teach your children to read that analog clock, go to Walmart and get that round tablecloth, put it on the floor, give them a clock and some post-it notes and say, replicate the clock on the, place on the tablecloth. Where do the numbers go? What numbers are they? Stand in the middle of the clock and say 12, 1 fourth, 1 half. The half an hour the clock hands will be here. Experience it with your whole body. Have the children get up and move and explore and create and build. They will be more engaged than with a clock this big. Have them do that before you bring it down to the pencil paper size. Measurement and money, time measurement money, are great ways to practice place value. If you want to teach money, don't do the one beer equals two Ethans and two Ethans and a tiny equal a bit. And that's the way most children learn money. I have a penny and five pennies equal a nickel and five nickels equal a quarter and a two nickels equal a dime and four quarters equal a dollar and their little heads are swimming. Put it on a place value mat and teach pennies, dimes, dollars. Put your pennies in a pyramid with four with one on top and say, you know what? We have a coin that's just like tally marks. It's called the nickel. Two sets of tallies equals a 10. Two nickels equals a dime. And have them build money quantities related to place value and name them before you ever introduce the quarter. The quarter comes last because what is 25 made of? Two tens, five ones two tens, five ones. It straddles two place values. So you have to use common sense and think, how is what I'm teaching like what they already know? Young children need to experience math before they enter the classroom. And this is one thing, uh, there's an article called Getting Ready for Arithmetic. It's cited in many studies. Hard to find the actual article now. But uh, in that particular article, they talk about the language small children need to learn before, after, between, larger, smaller, uh, greater than, smaller than, more, less. All of those words need to be in place before children encounter numbers. Uh, she said, Marie Sander, the article's in the handout I've given you. It's from 1980, Getting Ready for Arithmetic. And she says that children with handicaps need to be explicitly taught what others have absorbed through experience. Children who come from language-rich households may already know many and more and fewer, less, but they may not if they come from a household where they're put in front of a screen all day. Or maybe they're you know, put out in the yard to play and they, they don't have rich adult language around them. So we need to make sure that that language piece is in place before they get to school. So we do pattern recognition with sets. You can have children build patterns with numbers and pattern blocks, touch the base 10 blocks, or the craft books as they name their quantities. This is one I created with cookie cutters. Give each bear a travel article. Give each bear a nose. Give each bear two eyes. Those are activities that are math. You know that little Fisher Price thing where you put the little rings on the tower? That's a math tool. The biggest one goes on the bottom and the little one goes on top. That's a preschool math readiness activity. So we use these words like more than, less than, few, many, bigger, smaller, same as and different, same as and different. That's what I was doing with the four-year-old this morning. 
and that can rain that. I changed it from five plus two to three plus four, and it's, it's still seven. And he looked at me and he said, it's magic. It's still seven. We had a little girl in, in a class in New York, and she looked at the teacher aide next to her. I love this. It's a wonderful child. She's really bright, but she struggles with math concepts. And she got to third grade, and they're learning division, and she says to the math aide next to her, did you know that when you divide 12 by 4, you get 3 every time? And it occurred to her at that moment that math facts were fixed, that those number and quantity relationships suddenly made sense that you could depend on. So we look at these with pictures. We do cartoons. We do big dog, little dog, how many. Can you make a number sentence? Here I have 4 plus 4 equals 8. I could also do 2 times 4 is 8. I could do 3 plus 1. There were four, one stood up, three were still kneeling. You've got subtraction. Are the do doors the same or are they different? Are these dogs same or different? How are they the same? How are they not the same? So get your children to use oral language. So all of these, you know, when we have children who have poor early education until preschool, they get to kindergarten. We have to go back and put all this in. So if you're a teacher, you're looking for the children who don't have the language to support math and experiences with quantities. This can begin as early as the time the child is in a high chair counting Cheerios. I'm going to give you three crackers. Let's count them. One, two, three. That adult language paves the way for pre-calculus. We just don't realize it. So once formal math begins, we have to give them the procedures, but it has to be based on that conceptual awareness. And the rule about manipulatives is these things give a visual meaning and a tactile meaning to quantity relationships. It's called concrete. The concrete level of instruction leads to pictures, which leads to just numbers. And the instructional sequence is called Concrete, representational, abstract. And it is an instructional sequence appropriate for all students. So for example, many children must physically bundle that pen to understand what 10 is. When you hold up the 10 rod from a base 10 block set, you can say a rod or a long, and they see these 10 little marks on it, but they don't see the individual cubes. And there are children who must build it to understand it. And that's why I prefer craft sticks as an introduction to place value. And there's your 1,000. One little first grader here in North Carolina was counting by tens on a counting chart with just numbers. And he just didn't really understand what he was doing. And I looked at him and I said, well, what do we do when we get 10 of anything? He said, oh, we bundle. So we picked up our bundles of craft sticks of tens, and we, as we laid each bundle of ten down, we said ten, twenty, thirty, forty, etc. And when he got to a hundred, he got ten tens, and he tried to hold them in his hand, and he couldn't hold them and bundle at the same time. And he said to his friend, come help me, James. It takes four hands to hold a hundred. Now he had an awareness that a hundred was a large quantity. You don't get that from a piece of plastic. That tactile experience is integral to understanding quantity magnitude. So you have some construction paper squares that you got with your handout. Please take them, fold one of them in half, and tear it. Tear it in half. Take your other piece of construction paper and fold it into four equal pieces. So here I have my half.
here I have my green piece. Yours may be a different color. And I'm going to tear it in half. Then I'm going to tear that in half so that I have two halves and four fourths. And I'd like everybody to put your hand in the air and repeat after me. Like this. You ready? Put your hand in the air. Okay, here we go. Hiya! This is karate fractions. Fract is the Latin root that means to break into parts. Have we just made parts? Have we attempted to make them equal? You have made fractions. This one, we had four equal pieces. This one, we had two. I'd like everybody to add one-fourth and two-fourths, because the four told me the name of the fraction piece. When I add one-fourth and two-fourths, what do I get? Three-fourths. Excellent. Suppose I had four-fourths and I took away two-fourths. How many fourths would I have? You've just done addition and subtraction of fractions with a piece of paper. Let's do another one. Suppose I took my half and I wanted to know what one half of one half is. I want to take my half and break it into two equal pieces. And then I want to take one of them. So when I multiply one half by one half, one half of one half is one fourth. Want me to do that one again? All right. This is the one that teachers always say to me. I know how to tell my students to do it, but I can't tell them why it works. Ours not to reason why, just invert and multiply. So here we go. I would like to know what three-fourths, take three of your fourths and put them out, divided by one-half is. Now I'm going to remember what division means. One meaning of division, because there are two, is that if I have six, how many groups of three can I make? Two. There's one of our models of division. So if 6 divided by 3 is 2, how many pieces the size of 1 half can I make if I start with 3 fourths? Like everybody look at your paper and let's do this division together. If I start with 3 fourths, can I make all of a piece the size 1 half? Can I make this out of that much? Yeah, I can make one of my one-half pieces. Can I make another one? Do I have enough of the green to make another yellow? Well, what part of it do I have? The answer is one and a half. So let me walk you through that one more time. Given the quantity three-fourths, what I'm starting with is bigger than what I'm trying to make. Twelve divided by four. Is twelve bigger than four? It is. I can make groups of four. From three-fourths, I can make all of one half and half of another one. Some answers will come out, when you do the math, with three halves. Now if I reverse that, though, and I say, this is how much rope I have. I have one half yard of rope. I need, I really need, three-fourths. The question becomes, how much of what I need do I have? How much of three-fourths do I have? If I take one-half divided by three-fourths, how much of that do I have? Well, I only have two of the three-fourths. Would you agree? I have two of the three equal pieces, and the answer is two-thirds. I have two-thirds of what I need. Now, you can do that with fraction tiles. 
I've just done it with you with pieces of construction paper. Using repetitive language for concepts and helping students see the relationship, I would do maybe seven or eight of those kinds of problems. And I would do them with fraction tiles. And frequently, when I do this presentation with students, I am using fraction tiles. I will go back to the dot camera. This is relatively new since the last time I gave this presentation. But if I lay a tile down, and I say it takes two orange to make a black, the orange is one half of the black. Would you agree? One half of the black is the orange. And yet, at the same time, the orange, it takes three of them to make the brown. So while the orange is one half of the black, it's one of three equal pieces of the brown. We look at our proportional reasoning with fractions, and we say that our students can learn to do this proportional reasoning if you, even if you take the numbers away and the fractions become easy. So, I am taking the brown. I have the brown. What I need for my craft project is the size of the orange. So the brown divided by the orange, how many can I make? Three. I need to make the black, right? Or I have the black and I need to make the orange. How many can I make? Two. We just divided one half by one sixth and we got the quantity three. We just divided one third by one sixth and we got the quantity two. I can make two of these from that. I can make three of these from that. But if I reverse my order and I say, this is what I have. This is what I need. What I'm starting with is smaller than what I'm trying to make. That's 3 divided by 12 instead of 12 divided by 3. Now I'm asking not how many I can make, but how much of it can I make. And that language is central to children being able to understand the math. One of my favorite word problems I'll illustrate for you. It comes out of, I believe, Engage New York. It's on the park exam for many of our students. And it says, and if you want to draw this with me, you can. A pan of brownies was left on the counter. Now, what shape is a pan of brownies, everybody? It's a rectangle. I like to say a square pan because my mother had a 1950s cookbook and we made squares. Okay. A pan of brownies was left out on the counter, and one-fourth of it had been eaten. Can you all see that? All right. Tommy came along and ate two of the three pieces that were there. How many did he eat? Two of the three. So Tommy ate two of them. What do you think the question is for children? We could have how much is left, but you're wrong. That would be an easy, that would be too easy. How much of the whole pan did he eat? Now, if a child draws the picture, he can say, well, he ate half the pan of brownies. He did two-thirds of three-fourths and got one half. And that's the answer. But to know that it's multiplication, many of our children struggle with the words. And so the What Works Clearinghouse, I just gave this presentation at IDA this year, and it was uh, streamed from the IDA conference. If you want to see it, it's available on the International Dyslexia Association website. I think there's a fee because you can get CEUs for it, but it was a one-hour presentation blending reading comprehension and math word problems. And it was combining Eileen Marzola's work on reading comprehension with the newest updated What Works Clearinghouse practice guide on problem solving. And the strategy she uses, I'll give you right now because it's for any age. For reading comprehension, she says, think before, think along, think after. 
So as you read, you activate prior knowledge. Mm, what do I know about mummies? You think as you read along and you stop and you say, hmm, that's interesting. I didn't know that you could have a mummy created naturally when someone fell in a bog or, or you know, died on a mountain somewhere. That it's a natural mummification process, not just being wrapped up with chemicals in Egypt. I end that interesting. So you stop and reflect. And then at the end of what you read, she says, think after. So we think before, we activate prior knowledge, we think along as we read, and we think after. In math, I've modified that. It's think before. Hmm, it's about brownies. What size pan, what shape would it be? I reason and think about it as I go along, and I draw or calculate as I read. And then at the end, I can summarize my answer. So the new strategy for my students is think before, do along, and think after. And indeed, when I'm teaching word problems to students who struggle with reading, I only show them one line at a time. And I ask them to write the numbers or to draw a picture. And one of the major research findings on word problems is that children who can draw a picture are better able to solve the problem and state their answer at the end. That's our organization of language, our oral language. So as we pursue more of this stuff, how can we help our students? We can help them by teaching them how to do word problems, how to visualize the math, which comes from first the concrete manipulative, and then it comes from actually drawing pictures that represent that. So, fractions. Here's our What Works Clearinghouse and our summary of their findings. Students who struggle need multiple representations. They need explicit instruction with concrete manipulatives. And teachers must be proficient in using them. Do not torture students with base 10 blocks. Make sure that your manipulatives are efficient and effective for what you're teaching and get rid of them once the children understand. If a child has that variable memory, go back to the concrete level. You can cycle back through the manipulatives. Few elementary teachers receive any instruction in using manipulatives. They're in the curriculum. They're told use them. They're pictures of the base 10 blocks. But nobody teaches teachers, for the most part, how to use them effectively and what language to use. They are especially effective for older students. But these manipulatives, one of my presentations at Mississippi State was, what's in your closet? Because teachers don't use them. They'll say, oh, they're messy. I just keep them in there. I don't use them. And yet, for some students, they are essential. So the spiraling curricula is not as good for LD students. Because just when they're starting to grasp something and they need a little more repetition, the class moves on. So be wary of a spiraling curriculum. That does not mean we can't cycle back and maintain things. It means that if you're teaching you know, division of fractions on Monday and then you do geometry Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and you go back to, to division of fractions on Friday, it's not effective for the child who needs repetition. So you need to be aware of that. Procedural curricula, there are programs that push numbers around and just tell them what to do. I find that to be most prevalent at the algebra level. Teachers who do not want to, to use manipulatives or show students with concrete manipulatives have a tendency to just say, do this, do that, and get the answer. So we need to show them uh, everything with their manipulatives as they move on. So our children are not necessarily taught to reason and conceptualize it. In an effort to teach too much too fast, it is often said that American mathematics is a mile wide and an inch deep. We don't give enough depth of inquiry and problem solving. We don't give children enough time to really master things. And so mild to moderate severe learning difficulties can impact math a lot. And the one thing, as I was telling you earlier, I spoke to Dr. Sawitz about and this troubles me greatly, that we have 
people who do evaluations, school evaluations and private psychologists who are quick to say the child has dyscalculia, give him an accommodation. When indeed we now know, and Sally Shaywitz in her book says, dyslexic students have trouble with the language and organization of the math, more than the math itself. And there's a difference between math and arithmetic. The arithmetic is those foundation skills and number recall that we apply in mathematics. So if I put you through your paces on a few of these mental math activities, and I want to make sure we get into this. So let's all think about, first of all, if this is 1,000, what does 10,000 look like? You know, most teachers never go beyond the 1,000 cube. So here I have two. Would you count with me? Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's 10,000. And if I have two here, that's 12,000. Because what is 12 made of? One ten, two ones. And when we teach our numbers, we need to start with not the thousands place, but the ones of thousands, then the tens of thousands, and then the hundreds of thousands. And if you use that language, they will understand rounding much more thoroughly. A couple of other things. What does multiplication look like? Hmm. What does multiplication look like? Yeah. I'm going to make sure I get plenty of time here. Oh, yes. So I have a couple of representations here. The first one is the three times table. Making many by making many groups of three. Can you all see that? 3, 6, 9, 12. And this is making many groups of 4. And I lay them side by side. Do you notice that it changes color at the same place here? Like this changes color here and this changes color here. This changes color here. But look, they change color at the same place. It's called the least common multiple. If I take the same thing, and here's my group of threes, and I put it onto a longer rod like this, and I say, Jesse found $14 in the parking lot. He put it in his piggy bank. Every week after he got his allowance, he put $3 in the piggy bank with it. How much did he have after four weeks? That's a linear function in algebra. That's y equals mx plus b and slope-intercept form. I can build exponential growth with unifix cubes. One of my favorites, let me see if I got it here, Ooh. my string. Ooh. Well, if I don't have it quickly, I can't show you. I do a thing called strings with wings. And I thought I had that bag out. I guess those of you who will be here tomorrow will see it tomorrow because you're going to make some. You can make pi times tables with the strings. And you can do uh, percentages and fractions, putting pipe uh, beads on a pipe clean, I mean beads on a string, on a shoestring. And it makes a really wonderful manipulative. And anybody who wants to see it at the end of the workshop, I'll bring it out. Because I thought I threw it in the table. I <gasps> Wait a minute. I have it. Yay! So here it goes. Here's the seven times table. You ready? Colors must be contrasting. So I'm going to do seven. Two groups of seven makes, everybody say it with me. Three groups of seven is. Four groups of seven is. What is 3 of the 4 equal groups of 28? So 3 fourths of 28 is 21. What is 75% of 28? 
21. What is 50% of 28? And see, you can use this to do multiplication, division, and fractions, and percents and decimals. If this is 21, and I add one more bead to it, I have 22, don't I? How many groups of seven did I make? With a remainder of, out of the seven, I need to make a new group. There's division. You can also teach division to students with things like this. Take a string and say, make equal groups of three. How many groups of three can you make? One, two, three, four, five. From 15, I can make five equal groups of three. And if I had 16 and I'm dividing by three, I have a remainder of one. And by fourth grade, it's called one out of the three I need to make a new group, a remainder of one-third. Children can actually learn to see the math using these manipulatives. So let's round this out, coming to the end here. So mild to moderate language-based learning disabilities, a variety of learning disabilities, including uh, dysgraphia, attention deficit, all of these things can be taught with focused work with hands-on manipulatives explicit instruction, targeted math facts taught intensely, a few at a time to develop numeracy over time. So, well, let me go back to that here. So of the, we think that 17 to 20 percent of students in the population have learning disabilities of which possibly only 4 percent will be identified. There's a lot of children out there struggling with math who aren't really identified but benefit from these instructional strategies. And of those who are in learning, uh, those who are coded for learning disabilities, the vast majority have language-based learning disabilities. So it is any wonder that a large percentage of those incarcerated have learning disabilities. We actually know that in uh, prison populations that the illiteracy rate is incredibly high and that when you teach literacy in, in the institution, the recidivism rate drops. That's from the Department of Education. The third grade wall is that multiplication facts which we can te teach. So types of learning problems in math include numeracy, not knowing the add-ins of five, language-based problems like the organization, retrieval, and expression and sequencing of the math, uh, visualization of the quantities and getting that Milan language hemisphere engaged. The Hans suggests that that number module in the right parietal lobe is incredibly important. So then when we're retrieving math facts, it is a word retrieval activity. If we know that, we teach it differently. So my analogy is like learning the countries of the world and their capitals. And sometimes in parent populations, I will do a, uh, a demonstration where we do the capitals of Botswana, Zimbabwe, Namibia, and uh, South Africa. And then I have s people try to, to count them. So if we did that and we did Zimbabwe, the capital is Harare. The capital of Namibia is Vindahook. The capital of Botswana is Gaborone. And if I took 20 minutes with you, you might remember all of these. And so I use that. And that's the example of what learning the times tables is like. Notice that my times table chart is not completely filled out because anything that's in white is somewhere else in the times table. We don't need to learn our times table twice. I also like to teach multiplication and division at the same time because we don't need to learn our times tables twice. So we have some types of learning problems. I'll do these really quickly. This one is a tough one. Remember when we had computers and you do your email and somebody sent you a picture and it would take 20 minutes to come down the screen and your computer was on dial-up? Children who have processing speed deficits look like they're not paying attention. And the language in the math class is going too fast for them to process. And the simple accommodation a teacher can make is to make your instruction really explicit but when you teach something really important conceptually, articulate it clearly, give wait time for children to process what you're saying, and use repetitive c 
concept-based language. So just pausing and letting them soak it in for a second allows those children to process what you've said. Then you got to get excited. You got to have fun. You can't talk like that all the time in the classroom, or you put them to sleep. But when it's really important, make sure you pause. So we have struggling student type one who doesn't have numeracy. I've at length talked about how to teach that. Struggling student type two is the one with dyslexia who has trouble with the organization, retrieval, expression, and sequencing of the math. Structured procedures, hands-on instruction, and what I call the multi-sensory loop. Hear it, see it, say it, touch it all at the same time. Struggling student type three is our language processing deficit kids who are on dialogue give processing pauses. So true math disability or dyscalculia is extremely rare, which is why I sometimes take exception with just saying he can't learn his times tables, he's got dyscalculia, give him a calculator. I love calculators and I use them. But I also believe that if a child comes into class and he writes down the targeted number facts you're working on, and he does that on a daily basis and you use them, that child will learn them. So don't give up on them. We must not abrogate our responsibility to teach the skills to our students simply because they took a little more time to do it, to learn it. So the Math LD profile from uh, Stephen Pfeiffer, they're slower in basic numeracy processing tasks. Uh, between rapidly identifying numbers, counting forwards and backwards, making comparisons between magnitude. Uh, they may struggle in determining quantitative meaning of numbers. They have a poor use of strategy. That's the seventh grader who's still can't putting dots on numbers to count 7x and 5x. They may have difficulty learning basic calculation procedures. That's where the gross motor movements come in. They have errors in procedures, misalignment of numbers. They make uh, numbers from the bottom up. That's neurologically significant. They fail to regroup in a sequential manner. They often deploy a wrong computational process, and, and maybe they knew it on Tuesday and they messed it up on Wednesday. They, they had trouble remembering the sequencing. And poor retrieval of math facts. So our countries. And if I asked you to take, if I took the time to have you do that, many of you would not remember the names of those capitals. Working memory and math, he calls it the phonological loop, the visual spatial loop, and the central executive. Obviously, the central executive tells the child what to do when, but he's got to have that language loop that, that in his self monologue, where he self talks him through a procedure, whatever he says that's disorganized in oral language is also what he hears internally. So you have to sing the song of the math to him to where he knows that song the way when the oldies, you know, channel comes on in your car and you can sing along with your high school hit. They've got to hear, who's messing with my ex? How's he messing with my ex? How do I stop him from messing with my ex? That's solving equations. Those three questions take them to algebra two. They've got to have sequential cues, directionality cues, et cetera. Selective attention, their visual spatial planning, they need explicit instruction in drawing solutions. They have poor estimation skills, that's why manipulatives are so important. And difficulty determining what's important in word problems. Now, since his, his book came out, the Problem Solving Guide came out, where we now draw along as we're doing the word problems. They have trouble with the organization, and this self-monitoring piece is the piece that's the internal monologue. What do I do now? Oh, ours not to reason why, just invert and multiply. I don't know what it means. I can't tell if the answer's reasonable or not, but I just follow the procedure. So make sure your children are not just doing procedures. In the hierarchy of skills, place value, and composing and decomposing 10, we used to call it regrouping. And we don't borrow and carry, because honey, we ain't, we ain't giving nothing back. You gotta get rid of the old language that doesn't really accurately describe what we're doing in math. So we're not borrowing and carrying anymore. Now it's either composing and decomposing a 10, 
you can say regrouping in some programs. Go with what your child hears in school, but you need to learn what it means too. So that self-monitoring in a language the child understands and is meaningful. The basic codes of math, the verbal code, what do I do, the procedural code, but that magnitude code is the one that's taught with manipulatives. Do I understand what I'm doing at what level? So all of this is solved by creating that multi-sensory loop. So what can we do? Home stretch. Use a multi-sensory approach with evidence-based strategies. Use hands-on activities. The universal design for learning is multiple means of engagement. They do it with hands, they draw it with pictures, they tell it to you in stories, they build it, they construct it, they describe it. And that multiple means of engagement, multiple means of expression where they can show you, they can talk with their hands on it, say I did this, then I did that. How does that translate to the number problem when I do the algorithm? Make sure you create that multi-sensory loop. Use your concrete manipulatives. Make sure they draw pictures to support it, to get portable memory, and transition to the abstract. This is one I created, believe it or not, for middle school students. They get five-thirds. They color in five-thirds. Then they color it in on a number line. Then underneath, they color in the mixed numbers. So they can name that quantity three different ways, pictorially, they can name it, they put it on the number line. So differentiation, provide instruction which meets the needs of all learners in the classroom. There is some evidence, by the way, that when we teach all students in a multisensory manner, it doesn't hurt anyone. In fact, it helps all students. But it is essential for the students who learn differently. It's like all boats rise when the tide comes in because we've given them tools that address their multiple needs. And so fraction cards made with foamy shapes that the children build. Develop skills that rather than simply resort to accommodations, develop them in an appropriate manner, manner for the student while you are teaching grade level content. Multisensory math is a different way of thinking about math. It's a different way of thinking about teaching math. It is a methodology, it is not a curriculum or a program. It's how you teach with evidence-based methods so that it adapts to any program and any textbook. So let's do a little mental math now. I've been talking to you too long. I want you to all think about 17. What is 17 made of? 1, 10, 7, 1, seven. You all know your 17 times table, right? <laughs> okay, let's do a 17 times table. Here we go. 3 times 17, it's made of 1, 10, 7 ones. 3 times the 10 is, hold that number in working memory, say it 3 times, some of you are quicker than others at the language, 30, 30, 30. What's 3 times 7? Put them together. Good job. Let's do 5 times 17. 5 times the 7 is, hold that number in working memory, 50. 50, 50. What is 5 times 7? 50 and 35 is. Great. Let's do 7 times 17. 7 times the 10 is. 7 times 7 is. Now, for some of your students, and I did this deliberately, when you cross, when you add 49 to 70, they have to decompose 49 as 30 and 19 because they use the 30 to get to 100 because they know the ordered pairs of 10. And then they add the 19. So 7 times 23. What's 23 made of? Two tens, three ones. Two tens, three ones. What's 7 times 20? It's very similar to 7 times 2. 7 times 20 is? And 7 times 3 is? Put them together. You're doing mental math. One and a half times a number is all of the number and half of it more. One and a half times four is all of four and half of four more. One and a half times four is one and a half times 40 is all of 40 and half again more. 
What is one and a half times 40? One and a half times 800 is all of 800 and half of 800 more. And the answer is, and in Europe, you'd have to make the proper name, 1,200. Yes. because that's based on language, and students with language-based learning disabilities get lost in language as a process. That's why we don't do the sharing doubles anymore and the doubles plus one. To get to a quantity, when you use a strategy, it's not based on numeracy, it's based on language. And students with language-based learning disabilities learn 50,000 strategies as they go through elementary school. It's like when you're adding nine, add 10 and subtract one, but that's, Add 10 and subtract 1 is just adding more words to the arithmetic. It, it can be. And the strategies are great. It, we need multiple strategies. What I'm doing is based on numeracy. And as I said, the research on numeracy has fundamentally changed how we teach math. So closing this up now, it is explicit concept instruction, use of manipulatives, explicit instructional language, and the concrete representational abstract approach. Fewer facts at a time to develop fluency over time, meeting the needs of a standards-based curriculum for all students, and it expands from basic math through algebra and geometry. Uh, we're going to address the needs of all learners following the guidelines of the NCTM, the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics, Differentiate with restricted number facts. Fewer problems on a page, larger font, and ample white space for learning disabled students. And it then it is paying attention to the language for students with dyslexia. And so, interventions. Uh, we're going to give attention to the gaps in conce conceptual knowledge, focus on the big ideas, teach those restricted number facts and go from known to new. And so our big ideas, I call these the four superpowers of math. The first one is quantity awareness and subitizing. Once I know that, I can go to place value. We have standard form and expanded form. Standard form tells us the number's name. Expanded form tells us what it's made of. That allows us to act on the parts. Distributive property, we just did. We use that in algebra. And so I practice it as early as third and fourth grade. And the magic one, the conservation of quantity, that you can change the configuration of a number without changing its essence and what it is. Adaptations just include our hands-on, incremental instruction, concept cards, concept-centered instruction with explicit language that helps us to see the math. Food for thought. How would you describe 3.5 divided by 0 0.125? Everybody can do that for mental math. That's our last problem tonight. Let's see. Well, 3.5 is like 3.5. Can everybody visualize 3.5 pizzas? You can see those pizzas, right? We're trying to make pieces the size of one-eighth. How many one-eighth size pieces are in the first pizza? Eight. How many are in the next pizza? We're up to 16. How many in the last pizza? Okay, and in the half pizza? So you just did 3.5 divided by 0 0.125, and you got 28 and a half geometric. That's the link between our decimals and fractions. So our mental math, how much dirt is in a hole two feet by four feet by six feet? None. It's a hole. <laughs> how, much how much dirt is in a hole? 200 meters by 400 meters by 600 meters. It's a bigger hole. And that's what negative numbers are, the absence of quantity by magnitude. And I hope you've had a positive experience. Thank you very much for your kind attention and for all of you at home.